Good evening, everybody. Uh, today, we are having a lecture by Justice Abraham Matthew. In fact, uh, Justice Abraham Matthew joined as a uh, civil judge, junior grade, and the first class magistrate way back in 1988 at a place known as Devi Kula, which is, uh, which is quite near to Munar in Idiki district. Some of you must have heard of Munar. He started his career there. Before that, he practiced in the court set official courts at Wycombe with a uh, senior civil lawyer, a doyen of the bar. After becoming a judicial officer, he rose to the position of uh, sub-judge and assistant sessions judge, and he went on to become district and sessions judge. Then he became the additional director and later the director of the Kerala Judicial Academy. And then he became a judge of the High Court of Kerala. During his tenure as the additional director and director of the academy, he had the opportunity of training a lot of judicial officers in Kerala. So many of the officers who are now in Kerala are basically uh, Justice Abraham Matthew's trainees. After Justice Abraham Matthew left the academy as the uh, registrar vigilance in the High Court of Kerala, I joined the academy as, as its additional director. So our association goes a long way. And whatever Abraham Adhisar was doing in the academy, I started doing that. In fact, lecturing on evidence, lecturing on subtle nuances of criminal law, some aspects of the civil law, and uh, uh, court management. These were the topics which I used to deal with, and Abraham Adhisar also used to deal with many of these topics, especially the evidence law. Now, as you know, evidence law is pivotal more than any other law. Evidence law is composed of rules built on useful expediency and the understanding of real litigation. In fact, it is closely linked with human nature and society. You must understand the premises on which rules of evidence are constructed and the procedures in which they are rooted uh, are the result of the views of original framers of the law about human psychology. Actually, it rests on the way how people make judgments, draw inferences from verbal and other reports about objects and events and about organization and operation of the court. So, the evidence law, as I tell you, is more pivotal, very pivotal so far as understanding of the litigation process is concerned. Every trial of the fact, every lawyer, based, especially who's conducting cases before the trial courts should have a comprehensive understanding of the evidence law. You begin to think like a lawyer only when you know the nuances of law of evidence because legal thinking comes from law of evidence. It's uh, the aspect of relevance, materiality and uh, admissibility so far as adjudication civil or criminal or anything that matter in courts is concerned. So there is no better person to tell you about the uh, fundamental principles of law of evidence than Abraham Matthew who is about to join us. Till then I think I will carry on till he joins. See, if you simply read a treatise on law of evidence, you may of course, by reading you may get some idea about it. But uh, see, if you want to have a comprehensive ins insight about the subtleties of the evidence law, you will have to uh, get an understanding of it from the practitioner. In fact, I, though most of us, though we studied evidence law in the law colleges, only when we come to the trial practice with, the, with our senior, we understand the importance of relevance and admissibility so far as judicial trials are concerned and also the importance of proof. How do you believe or how do you consider a matter probable uh, by sifting through the large materials of facts, evidential facts, evidences which are adduced before the court of law. So uh, the James Fitz Stephen who actually uh, drafted the Indian Evidence Act, not just the Indian Evidence Act. In 1872, he, 1860, 1860, late 1860s, he came to India. 
He drafted the Contract Act. He drafted the 1880 Criminal Procedure Code. He drafted the Evidence Law. He drafted the Transfer of Property Act. In all this, Stephen's fingerprints you can see. And also the Civil Procedure Code. When you go through that, you will find the uh, real nexus with the uh, Evidence Law and the uh, CPC and CRPC. You know, Justice Abraham Matthews is us. And uh, I can tell you that evidence, I mean, experience by degrees uh, gives you a comprehensive understanding of subtle subtleties of law of evidence. And there is no better person to tell you about that than Justice Abraham Matthew. I just welcome him and we'll wait for him. His name has appeared on the, uh, I think he's just to join us. Um, good evening, sir. Can you please unmute your audio and video? Um, hello. Uh, good evening, Justice Matthew. So you may please continue and then so you may please continue. So in a minute we'll join. There is some yeah, sure, sure, please. Sure. Sure. So I, I was telling about the, uh, see, so far as uh, evidence law is concerned, see experience, in fact, according to James Fitzstephen, gives by degrees, a comprehensive acquaintance with the principles of the law with which a practitioner is conversant. So knowledge of the uh, nuances of law of evidence, if you get it from a trained uh, lawyer, or a judge or an educator, especially one who has practical acquaintance with the actual practice of law in the courts, only then you will have a good understanding of law. As I told you, you think like a lawyer when you read the provisions of, especially the first part in the uh, evidence law relating to relevancy, because relevancy is the fundamental concept on which the Stephen's law of evidence is uh, built on. Now, you can see that uh, the concept of relevance actually plays a pivotal role in legal fact finding. You will find that Thayer, it is Thayer who articulated the significance in terms of the this foundational principle of law of evidence. In fact, he articulated in America. Uh, he said that nothing which is not relevant can be received as evidence by the court. And secondly, uh, whatever is relevant is receivable as evidence. So a fact cannot be relevant in isolation. It is relevant only when it is logically connected or uh, when it is connected to another fact. So in other words, relevance is a uh, relational concept. The relevance is a relational concept. One fact is relevant to the another. Hello. Yes, yes. Sir. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, I'm. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Brahm Master has come here. I have been trying yes, for 10 minutes. <laughs> in your absence, I just uh, was talking to them. No, no. I was waiting for I, you. Yes. I, heard, I heard you speak, but I don't know yes, what sir. happened. I would not. I was not seen by you. <laughs> sir. I heard, yes, sir. I heard you speak. <laughs> Yes, sir. Now, uh, now that you are here, sir, you can uh, uh, enlighten us on the aspects of fact, fact initial yes. and relevance. Your uh, introduction is over, I think. Yes, sir. Introduction is over in your absence. 
<laughs> okay. Yes. Good evening, my dear friends, Mr. Harindra Vap, and uh, all participants. So, as Mr. Harindra Vap told, this is a very important topic so far as the practicing advocates are concerned. But at the same time, this is a topic sometimes uh, we are unable to understand properly because uh, some theory is involved in it. And uh, practicing advocates are not more interested in theory. But though we have many doubts, uh, sometimes uh, we feel reluctant to ask anyone, or sometimes uh, uh, everything will be confusing for us. Such a topic we are discussing today. So the topics I will be discussing are facts, facts in issue, relevant facts, relevancy, and admissibility. These are the topics we are uh, discussing today. So facts, as you know, almost all these uh, terms have been defined in the Indian Evidence Act. We shall first start with facts. Fact means and includes. In includes anything, state of things, or relation of things, capable of being perceived by the senses to any mental condition of which any person is conscious. Any person is conscious. Here, we can see that it's a close one. Close one. They are said to be physical or external things or facts. And the second clause is said to be internal or mental conditions, mental aspects. Or mensuria is a part of it. We can see section 14. Section 14 should be read along with this definition. Facts showing the existence of any state of mind such as intention, knowledge, good faith, negligence, rashness, ill will, or goodwill towards any particular person, or showing the existence of any state of body, or bodily feeling are relevant. When the existence of any such state of mind or body or bodily feeling is an issue or relevant. So, this is a mental condition. Mental condition mostly related to this mens rea. Now again, we come back to this fact illustrations. That there are certain objects arranged in a certain order, in a certain place, is a fact. So these are physical things. We can see it. We can perceive it. That a man heard, a, heard or saw something is a fact because it can be seen with our eyes. That a man said certain words is a fact. That a man holds a certain opinion, has a certain intention, acts in good faith, or fraudulently, or uses a particular word in a particular sense, or is or was at a specified time conscious of a particular sensation is a fact. <coughs> we know that in section 60, which says that, Oral evidence should always be direct. It is provided that if the evidence is to be given of an opinion of a person, it should be given by the person who holds that opinion, holds that opinion. So opinion also is a fact. Opinion also is a fact. The person who holds that opinion should enter the witness box and depose. This is all what is required under section 60. Now we come to facts in issue. Facts in issue. Facts in issue, it is also defined. The expression facts in issue means and includes any fact from which either by itself or in connection with other facts the existence, non-existence, nature or extent of any right, liability or disability asserted or denied in any suit or proceeding necessarily follows. So 
the first thing we have to bear in mind is that the expression means and includes indicate that indicates that this is an exhaustive definition we cannot add anything to it we cannot delete anything from it so the expression facts in issue means and includes any fact which either by itself or in connection with other facts the existence non existence or nature or extent of any lie right liability or disability asserted or denied in any fact or proceeding necessarily follows so it may be a civil proceedings or it may be a criminal proceedings proceeding includes both civil and criminal suit of of course it is a civil nature it is only a civil case then again right liability or disability again this indicates that it can be either civil or criminal asserted or denied so it may be a negative fact or it may be affirmative or positive fact so there is no difference between civil case and criminal case so far as the definition is concerned but how these so facts in issue are ascertained in a civil case we can see civil case we know issues are framed under article 14 sorry order 14 under order 14 we frame issues and issues are framed on the basis of pleadings pleadings documents answers to interrogatories etc 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 so it is very easy for civil cases and uh, one more thing we have to bear in mind is that in a suit it is necessary to frame issues before the parties go to trial because the parties that do not try a suit actually the parties try issues in a civil case only issues are tried the obvious reason is this many things the parties might have stated in their pleadings in their pleadings but they may not be tried only the facts which are covered by the facts in issue are tried or evidence can be recorded adduced only in respect of facts in issue and this may be on the basis of plain this may be on the basis of written statement take a case where um where or we can say that facts necessary to establish the plaintiff's case is a fact in issue that is individual rights which constitute bundle of rights which would form the cause of action this is actually fact in issue and it need not be based on pleadings it may be based on defense also take a case where a suit is for recovery of possession on the basis of trespass by the defendant uh, the defendant says that it is true that the plaintiff had title but he has lost title by adverse possession adverse possession and limitation okay if that is true the plaintiff's title is original title is submitted but the defendant raises a contention that he has perfected the title by adverse possession so that will be an issue that is a fact in issue fact in issue so this indicates that the fact in issue need not be on the basis of plaint alone there can be issues on the basis of defendant or on the plaint the contentions raised by the defendant take another case which is for partition of properties if one of the defendants sets up a will as a defense he says that the predecessor has bequeathed his properties to me by a will and the plaintiff is not entitled to any property there is no question of partition then if the defendant suppose he has filed a replication then certainly he will deny it even otherwise the defendant has to prove the will set up by him so the genuineness of the will will be a fact in issue it simply means that in civil cases facts in issue depend upon the pleadings of the parties and before the parties go to trial they are given notice of the facts in issue in respect of which only evidence can be adduced 
Now, in criminal cases, we know that there are no pleadings. In the case of a police institute case, police report cases, there will be a final report. Final report is nothing but the opinion of the investigating officer who filed the final report. It is not a substitute for pleadings, actually. But the court frame charges on the basis of the materials relied on by the prosecution in favor of the final report. Final of the final report. But no issues are framed. There is no requirement of framing issues because especially there are no pleadings. The defense is not known at least until the cross-examination starts. So what about the criminal case then? In criminal cases, the points are raised, not issues, only when the judgment is written. Before that, there is no question of issues. There is no question of points or facts in issue. But the defense may be disclosed during the cross-examination. Suppose in the case, the, the suggestion in the cross-examination indicates that the accused was insane at the relevant time then it becomes a fact in issue. Even though the prosecution case is that he has committed murder of a particular person, the victim, the insanity pleaded by the defense also will be a fact in issue, and that will be a point to be considered by the judge in his judgment. Then consent. Suppose the defense is that it's a case where consent is required. Consent is required. Take the case of a rape or something like that, some offense like that. So here, the consent, it is a material issue. The defense suggests that, or attempts to prove that, there was consent. So consent is an issue. Suppose the defendant, the accused, admits that, OK, there was a sexual intercourse, but it was a consensual act. Then that is the issue involved in it. So in criminal cases, facts in issue are actually the points that arise during the trial. And they are raised only in the course of the, or uh, when a judgment is written on. So this is the, actually what we mean, facts in issue, facts in issue. Then the next one is, next term we have to consider is a relevant fact, a relevant fact, relevant. The definition is this, one fact is said to be relevant to another, when the one is connected with the other in any of the ways are referred to in the provisions of this act are relating to the relevancy of facts. So what is a fact, relevant fact? The concept of relevant facts actually presupposes two facts. So unless there is a nexus between these two facts, we cannot say that one is relevant to the other. So to have this concept of fact, uh, relevant fact, two facts are necessary, and there should be a nexus between them. There should be a relationship between them. This relationship is called actually the relevant fact, a relevant fact. So it is just like a husband and wife. There should be a relationship. Just like uh, uh, friends, there is a relationship. So one is said to be relevant to the other only when there are two facts. Otherwise, there is no question of uh, the concept of relevant facts. On the other hand, in fact, in issue, no such concept is there. It is the, it is the issue that arises from the pleadings or the uh, trial in the criminal cases. Now, what is the difference between relevant facts and uh, this uh, facts in issue, facts in issue? Facts in issue can be said to be the principal facts, the principal facts which are sought to be proved or which should be proved by the party consent. But facts, relevant facts are evidentiary facts which are necessary to establish the facts in issue, the facts in issue. So the principal facts are called the facts in issue and the facts which are sought to be introduced during the evidence, during the evidence to establish the fact in issue are called relevant facts. 
they are called evidentiary facts evidentiary facts so evidential facts are necessary to prove facts in issue facts in issue and we can compare this to a, a wheel of a cycle it has a hub then there are spokes so the hub can be said to be the fact in issue and the spokes are can be said to be the relevant facts so all of them are attached to the hub likewise how uh, when uh, when a particular issue is taken up for trial there may be several facts so these are several facts related to the fa a particular fact in issue they actually relate to the a particular fact in issue they go to prove that particular fact just like the spokes connected to the hub of the wheel of the cycle okay now we know that or uh, now we can see the relevancy and uh, admissibility admissibility what is the importance of this uh, relevant facts section 5 section 5 evidence may be given of facts in issue and relevant facts evidence may be given in any suit or proceeding of the existence or non existence of every fact in issue and of such other facts as are here and after declared to be relevant and of no others no others okay now what is the what is the importance of this section the importance of this section is that it provides that evidence may be given of two things only one fact in issue which is the principal fact and the other facts which have been declared relevant by this indian evidence act so how can you prove a fact you can prove a fact by evidence only by evidence only it can be oral or documentary or material evidence or now electronic evidence these are the four types of evidence that can be adduced by a party to prove a particular fact here what is significant is that what the section says is that see evidence may be given evidence may be given what does it mean if a fact can be a fact has been in issue or a fact has been declared relevant by this act then you can adduce oral evidence documentary evidence or material evidence and in other cases electronic evidence to prove that particular facts that's why when you come to section 6 6 which appears to be very strange for certain people say facts which do not in issue are so connected with a fact in issue as to form part of the same transaction are relevant whether they occurred at the same time and place or at different times and places so we know that it is a principle of res gestae of the same transaction part of the same transaction that is uh, involved in section 6 take a case where uh, we take that uh, saumya murder case saumya murder case go with the chamis case there a middle aged man who was standing at the door of a coach cried out a girl jumped out of the train girl jumped out of the train so this was uh, heard by two young men and uh, at the trial this uh, or the during the investigation the identity of this middle aged man could not be ascertained but these two young men who heard him say 
that a girl gem has jumped out, they were available and they were examined. So we may just feel that. See how can how is this possible? The man who shouted, he was not available, he was not examined. Then how the persons, the two young men who heard it, they were examined and their evidence was acted upon by the court. How is it possible? The reason is simply this. Section 6 declares that the, 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 the shouting of that man, that middle-aged man, is a relevant fact. He cried out. That is a relevant fact. If that is a relevant fact, then Section 5 declares that evidence may be given. So what he, what he did was he shouted or he cried out. So it is a fact which can be heard by others. So under Section 60, if it can be heard by a person, then he can give evidence. So the two young men who heard the middle-aged man shout, they were examined as witnesses because Section 5 declares that evidence may be adduced of the facts declared relevant. When resistance has been declared relevant by Section 6 of the Evidence Act, evidence may be given that the man shouted that a girl jumped out of the train. That's why Section these two, the, the, even though that man who shouted, in fact, that is the resistance, but he was not available. The two young persons who heard them, heard him shout, were examined, and their evidence was acted upon. The simple reason is this. Section 5 declares that. They are, would, it be, would it be correct to say that since it was a part of the same transaction, because the jumping was going on, yes. and the other man shouted, and when the transaction was going on, the other two persons heard it, and yeah, therefore, right. it becomes admissible in evidence. Yes. Because the what, evidence act... What becomes a day is not the girl jumping out of it, but the yes. shouting of that man. Yes, sir. The yes. shouting yes. of that man became Rasjiste. So you can give evidence. Any bystander. Because of Section 5. Yes. Any, anything said by the bystander ah, yes. is heard by another person. Yes. Because so, it is part of the same transaction. But suppose. Same transaction. Uh, now suppose take another case. Yes. So the, the distinction is this. Suppose they had not heard it. They had not heard it. Let us assume a situation where this shouting was not heard by the people who had reported that. But they had got the information from somebody else. Then it is not part of the same transaction and therefore it is not. Oh, right, right, right. Because okay. it is a, only a report made by yeah. the... A reporting. So that is, a person is reporting. Okay. Now, so take one is rest, yes, sir, I have another doubt. Because this uh, Subramaniam versus public prosecutor, that is accepted by the Supreme Court in Balram Prasad Agarwal's case. There, it is said that evidence of a statement made, by, made to a witness who is not himself called as a witness may or may not be hearsay. It is hearsay and inadmissible. When the object of the evidence is to establish the truth of what is contained in the statement, it is not hearsay and is admissible when it is proposed to establish by evidence not the truth of the statement but the fact that it was made. So, okay. sir, this the reason is simply this. Yes, sir. The, 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 the idea of hearsay evidence yes, sir. understood in several ways. So, there cannot be a universal definition for the term hearsay evidence. That is the difficulty. See, suppose FA statement is given. FA statement is given on the basis of hearsay alone. Hearsay alone. Still, the information discloses commission of an offense. So the police have to register a case. It is registered. It is registered. Admittedly, it is uh, nothing but hearsay. Every sentence is hearsay. Every sentence is hearsay. But is it possible to give this FA statement in evidence? For is corroboration... The... Eh? Corroboration under 157, you can No, 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 no. The, the corroboration of the statement of the person who has given the FI statement. No, it can be used only for one purpose. Yes. How this case happened to be registered? How this case happened to be registered? 
only for that purpose this can be used this can under be 157 used. under 157 yeah. no 157 is not possible here 157 is not applicable here corroboration there is no question of corroboration here here he would say how or the 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 investigating officer can come and depose that i happen to register the case on the information given by a person yes and he would depose the fi statement the informant would depose that he heard it and he gave the information to the police and no, i am only saying i am only saying this sir. the corroboration aspect is when the fi statement is produced and marked no the statement the fact that he had given a statement of this nature to the police yes. Yes. that alone is and that fact can be corroborated that can be corroborated that can that be corroborated. for no other purpose it can be used and uh, not for the relevant factor yeah yes sir right 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 but uh, we know that there are one decision of the supreme court that no evidence can be no affidavit can be no case can be registered on the basis of uh, hearsay evidence also that is a different question anyway we need not to discuss yes, it now because that is beyond the scope of our uh, uh, discussion now okay so take another case where a young man murdered his wife at his house a young man then his mother saw the acts the commission of the offense then she shouted standing in her house oh my son murdered his wife murdered his wife this was heard by a neighbor he did not see this commission of the offense he heard the um, uh, the mother of this accused shout that he my son murdered his wife this mother was examined but she turned hostile she said that no i did not say so but, but the neighbor was examined he deposed that yes i heard her shout that oh my son murdered his wife the reason is that this can be acted upon because section 5 declares that evidence may be given of what evidence may be given or a fact declared relevant the fact declared relevant is the risk just the risk just here is the shouting of that woman so anybody who heard it can come and say that okay i heard you her shout it that is why it was acted upon by the supreme court so that is the importance of uh, um the phrase evidence may be given evidence may be given now we come to uh the question whether it can be only of uh, affirmative fact or a positive fact the section itself declares that evidence may be given of existence or non existence of every fact existence that is a positive one affirmative one non existence that is a negative one absence of something absence of something and the most important application of this is we can see in negligence cases negligence cases take section 304a or uh, in a civil case negligence of the doctor here what is sought to be proved is a negative fact that is a non existence or absence of a absence of care that should have been taken by the party concerned so it can be negative it can be affirmative and we know that what is negative in negative in language need not be negative in law or in form it is negative but in substance it may be affirmative i hope you have followed it in form it is negative because non existence of a fact you are going to prove non existence of a fact not existence of a fact it is a negative fact then how can you prove it <coughs> take a case where a lady was found practicing law practicing law a case was registered against her that she had uh, she had not got herself enrolled as an advocate or she did not have even a llb degree and when the case came up for trial 
the prosecutor says so it is a negative fact a person who suppose that the lady had enrollment certificate or had passed the llb then she has got the best evidence with her there is a positive evidence so she should prove especially under section 106 section 106 is a matter within her knowledge special knowledge so is it possible or should it be allowed can the prosecutor say it? no we all know that it is not at all possible because in every criminal case in invariably in all cases the burden is always on the prosecution to start the evidence start the evidence so how can the prove it a negative work how can it be prove it the prosecution prove it so the prosecution has to examine the investigating officer who wanted her to produce a certificate so he should enter the witness box and depose that i saw her practicing wearing gowns and uh, arguing case in court and i asked her to produce her enrollment certificate she did not produce it that is sufficient the burden is disturbed so in form it is a negative one but in substance it is a positive one it is an affirmative one this happens in a ticketless traveler ticket the traveler he did not have a ticket that is the prosecution case can the prosecution say prosec the prosecutor say see he, if he had a ticket he would have known it it was within his special knowledge so he should produce it so he should adduce evidence first it is not possible <coughs> then how can it be discharged we all know it the ticket examiner should enter the witness box and state three sentences i found her traveling on the railway without a ticket sorry uh, i found her traveling on a railway i demanded her to produce the ticket she did not produce it so that negative fact is been proved by this three sentences the initial burden is disturbed that's why in section 5 these two phrases are used the existence or non existence of facts that can be proved so without yeah. interruption there is a supreme court decision on this yeah. proof of yeah. negative evidence sir yes that is ar 1999 supreme court 2008 yes that is bharat barrel drum manufacturing company versus amin chand yarela yes. that is actually it comes in civil case in civil case bharat right. barrel drum manufacturing company versus amin chand yarela there are two kerala decisions also there are two yes, kerala sir. decisions yes sir. there are two kerala decisions also That is Reverend Mother Mary Kutty versus All right, Nandi C Kutter. Yes, yes. Okay. So now we have seen that Section Five declares that evidence may be given only of two things: fact and issue. or fact declared or relevant that is from section 6 to 55 section 55 does it mean that evidence may be given by a party of all or relevant facts does it mean that the party can give evidence of all or relevant facts in other words the question is whether the evidence of all relevant facts are admissible admissible how this fact in issue or relevant fact is affected this is the question before us see we know that the words relevancy and admissibility they are used interchangeably they are used interchangeably that means without noting that in distinction without making any distinction between them these two words are used one for the other we are we are, always we see it but is there any difference that is the question see relevancy we have seen it is the relationship between two things and once it is relevant evidence may be given of it that means oral evidence documentary evidence or material objects if it is material evidence also can be given so does it mean that any fact related to a relevant fact is admissible admissible
See, in fact, they are not synonymous. They are totally different. They are totally different. Suppose a promissory note is a, a execution of a promissory note is the fact in issue. Section 5 mandates that or uh, declares that evidence may be given of it. It is a fact in issue. So you can examine a witness. You can use uh, or, or documentary evidence to prove that he has executed, if he has written a letter to another person, etc. That can be done. There is nothing wrong in it. That itself is a fact in issue. Suppose when it is a tendered in evidence, it is found that it did not bear proper stamp. Proper stamp. Is it, is it admissible? It is not admissible. Though execution of a promissory note is a relevant fact, it is not admissible because of the provisions contained in the part dealing with the mode of proof, mode of proof, or other facts. So how this admissibility is affected, we can say. Admissibility is affected. The admissibility of a relevant fact is affected. Relevant fact is affected by various statutory provisions. Various statutory provisions. We know that there are some communications, privileged communications. Communication between advocate and client. Communication between uh, husband and wife. Communication between legal advisor and client. All these are privileged. Though they are relevant, you cannot adduce any evidence. You cannot adduce any evidence. So we cannot say that you can adduce evidence of all relevant facts because of certain other provisions in the statute. Now you can come to section this, this uh, promise or not we have already seen. So what prevents this uh, relevant part being admitted in evidence? It is the provision in the stamp act. So the provision in section 34 Kerala Stamp Act and 35 Indian Stamp Act prohibits admitting this document in evidence because it is insufficiently stamped. So though it is relevant, because of the insufficiency of the stamp and by virtue of the provisions in view of the provisions in section 34 of the Stamp Act and 35 of the Indian Stamp Act, it cannot be admitted in evidence. It cannot be admitted in evidence. So also, Take a registered a document which is a compulsorily be registrable. A document which is a compulsorily registrable. Section 49 says that if a document is a compulsorily registrable, registration act, if it is a compulsorily registrable, no evidence can be proved, can be uh, allowed to be allowed to prove that fact. That means the fact which is sought to be achieved, the relationship that is sought to be achieved by the transaction. But at the same time, it says that, okay, to prove collateral facts can be adduced in evidence. So suppose a sale deed, which is not registered, is tendered in evidence. The question may be, it may be a title suit. <coughs> Still, it is not admissible because of Section 49 Registration Act. So, Again, that admissibility is affected of a relevant fact. Now, another section is uh, section 91 to 94. 91 to 94 evidence acts. That is the exclusion of oral evidence by documentary evidence. So the fact may be relevant. The fact may be fact in issue. Still, it may not be possible. Then, sections of 59 to 65, etc. of of uh, evidence acts, evidence acts. They deal with mode of proof, mode of proof. And section 64 declares that evidence may be, or the contents of a document can be proved, contents of a document can be proved by producing the documents, by producing the documents. The party produces a secondary evidence a copy of a document. But he does not explain, he does not explain the non-production of the original. Non-production of the original. 
can he tender written evidence no it is not admissible because he has failed to comply with the conditions in section 65 so again though it is a relevant fact its admissibility is affected by the provisions contained in this uh, part, this part of uh, indian evidence act now um, the purpose for which purpose for which it is sought to be proved is not permitted is not permitted take a case of section 157 certain documents can be proved only to corroborate for corroboration section 157 159 only to refresh memory okay now cpc there are provisions which prohibit admitting a document in evidence though the fact is relevant order 13 rule 1 says rule 1 cpc provides that it should be produced along with the or this uh, other provisions of crpc cpc provides that a document relied on by the plaintiff should be produced along with the plaint or uh, when the issues are framed before the issues are framed before the issues before the issues are framed or even later with the permission of the court with the okay. permission like with the return statement also the party should produce a document with the return statement if not before the framing of the issues and even then even there are with the permission of the court it can be adduced in evidence suppose he does not produce it he does not produce it and he does not obtain permission of the court then even though it is a relevant fact it cannot be admitted in evidence it cannot be admitted in evidence so what follows from this is even if a fact is a, a fact which is an issue or declared a fact declared relevant by section 5 sorry section 655 it may not be admitted in evidence because of certain prohibitory because of certain provisions contained in indian evidence act itself or other the provisions in other statutes it follows that relevancy and admissibility are entirely different they are entirely different so what is the difference between in simple words what is the difference between relevancy and admissibility relevancy we have seen it is a relationship this is called a logical relevancy logical relevancy the relevancy is called logical relevancy because there should be a nexus between the two facts and that tends to prove a relevant fact a relevant fact this is called uh, logical relevancy Rele sorry no, logical relevancy relevancy is the tendency to prove a fact relevancy is the tendency to prove a fact then what is admissibility admissibility is the legal relevancy admissibility is the legal relevancy in other words admissibility is the receivability in evidence a receivability in evidence we know that if you want a gift of something to a person you should give it in a presentable form you should give it in a presentable form so if it is not in a presentable form then nobody would like it so suppose you want to give make a gift of a gift of something at the reception of a couple marriage then you will have a presentation wrapper you have it in a presentable form then you will present it on the desk on the stage and if it is no packing will you present it to him no so you have to make it though the thing you make a present of is something which is useful to that those persons 
unless you make it in a presentable form nobody would like it nobody would like it likewise even though the evidence is uh, relevant the fact is relevant and the court can take notice of it the court can receive it unless it is uh, presented in a receivable form the court will not act upon it the court will not admit it in other words the court will not uh, receive it unless it is given in a presentable form in a presentable form so that presentable form is called mode of proof mode of proof secondary evidence the contents of a document may be relevant but you are not giving it in the form in which the law prescribes it should be given the manner in which it should be given is prescribed by the law you are not doing it you are not doing it so it is not in a presentable form it is not in a receivable form so the court cannot receive it even though it is a good thing even though it is a relevant fact it is not admissible this is the difference between admissibility and uh, relevancy relevancy you may note down a decision ar 1998 supreme court ar 1998 supreme court 1850 the legal implications of relevancy and admissibility are distinct a relevant fact need not be admissible an admissible fact need not be relevant this is discussed in that decision This is Ram Bihar in Yadav versus the state of Bihar. Then, what is the power of the court? what's the power of the court regarding admissibility of a relevant facts admit admissibility of facts or admissibility of evidence we have always uh, or we often hear of this uh, evidence being admitted without any objection whether it is oral or documentary sometimes the other party fails to object to it and it happened to be made part of the evidence because of a want of objection even though it was inadmissible or irrelevant irrelevant especially when it is inadmissible so what does section 5 say section 5 say section 5 says that evidence may be given in any suit or proceeding of the existence or non existence of every fact in issue and of such other facts as are here and after declared to be relevant then there are four words followed and of no others mm-hmm. and of no others so what does it mean therefore prohibition for sir if irrelevant evidence is irrelevant evidence is let in you can't look yeah. into it you can father you can't look into it that is true if irrelevant evidence comes in yes okay but before that we are not at that stage before that actually what happens see it is the duty of the court it is the duty of the court whether there is objection or no objection it is the duty of the court to see that a fact which is not admissible a piece of evidence which is not admissible is not admitted in evidence the court should not wait for the objection of the parties yes this duty of court can be seen the duty of the court can be seen section 5 we have already seen now come section 60 come to section 
oral evidence must must in all cases whatever be direct see must in your video is yeah. not coming sir pardon your video was not coming now it is okay oh, I see. so section 60 it declares that oral evidence must that means it is compulsory it is a duty it is a command so the court has a duty to see that section 60 is complied with now come to section 65 64 64 documents must be proved by primary evidence primary so here also the words used that must be proved must be proved so the court has a duty again we come to section 60 136 136 when either party proposes to give evidence of any fact the judge may ask the party proposing to give the evidence in what manner the alleged fact if proved would be relevant and the judge shall admit the evidence if he thinks that the fact if proved would be relevant and not otherwise so it's a command to the dog command to the court what is that the court the judge shall admit the evidence if he thinks that the fact if proved would be relevant and not otherwise that means the court shall not other otherwise allow it so it casts a duty on the court to ascertain the relevance of a fact before it is admitted in evidence whether there is objection or no objection now see what are the stages that which this section 1 that is the first part of section 136 be applied it it becomes applicable even before the witness is put in trial box suppose a party proposes to adduce uh, to examine a witness the court can always ask him what is the facts which you want to prove through him ordinarily that should be shown in the witness schedule itself for what purpose is so to be examined and in the column we should prove the fact which is so to be examined just like a criminal cases but i think in kerala it is not done instead what will be written there is to prove, to prove that the plain this case is true that is not actually complying with this section so in such cases the court has to first ascertain why should i summon that witness why should i summon that witness what point what fact you want to prove is it relevant is it relevant so at the beginning itself before the summons is issued the court can ascertain from the party how his evidence would be relevant and suppose he is put in the witness box and he has he is giving evidence then suppose a question is put to him or a fact is sought to be uh, proved through him even then the court can ask him or the party how it is relevant so the relevancy has to be ascertained by the court of the evidence of a particular witness or of the particular statement or particular piece of evidence before it is admitted in evidence and irrelevant evidence irrelevant evidence does not be the admissible merely because there is no objection it is always relevant irrelevant objection or no objection an irrelevant fact does not become relevant merely because it is admitted in evidence then what about evidence illegally obtained illegally obtained it is irrelevant how this uh, evidence was obtained by the party obtained by the party that is applicable in civil cases and criminal cases also ar 73 supreme court 157 which is uh, consistently followed or in or the supreme court has always held or it is a very central position uh, proposal uh, proposition of law that what is the how he happened to obtain that evidence is relevant once it is made a part of the evidence in the case but in english law there is a, they have taken a different view to some extent 
it is says that if a strict observance of a rules of evidence operates unfavorably against a party for example suppose the evidence was obtained by playing a trick on the opposite party then the court can uh, rule out that evidence but that is not strictly applicable in india that was uh, decided in um, uh, privy council that's a privy council decision kuruma versus rex kuruma versus was the 1 all in a report of 236 236 is an mp sharma constitution bench mp sharma is also there yes sir Then, one 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 thing what what sir one fact i wanted to point out yes one is that this american law following miranda the fruits of the poisonous tree that is what they say are not admissible so if the illegality in search illegally obtained evidence in america they call it fruits of the poisonous tree but yes, as right, so right. far as that is concerned in india it is not applicable nonetheless not applicable. nonetheless sir this yes. nonetheless sir in selvi's case selvi's case they yes. have drawn a distinction so far as right, police right, confessions are concerned the facts are entirely different yes the facts are entirely different the first decision of the supreme court uh, in this regard is ar 1956 supreme court 411 yes sir yes sir ar 1956 supreme court 411 Evidence are collected even in a legal search. MP Sharma. Yes, it is uh, admissible. Admissible. Not the American view or the English view is not uh, strictly applicable. Though the English decision was rendered in uh, Indian case, Indian case by the Privy Council. That's entirely different one. Okay. so one sir, that is it. yes there is one not one difficulty also sir even derivative use of confessions obtained ah. by uh, by exerting pressure or illegal yes. means yes. by virtue of kathikalo uh, god and selvi hmm. now there is a bar in india also yes, yes. That, that is there sir of course that is even search, as, as you rightly pointed out in the case of search it is not there even yeah. if the search is illegal the evidence is admissible but but the other thing is entirely different yes sir yes sir the article to be will apply the d yes, clause three will apply then section 24 will apply 24 will apply 24 evidence act will apply apply even even in the case of even in the case of admissions forget the forget this uh, criminal cases confession even, even in the admission. case of admissions if admission, it is that is hit by any of the vitiating circumstances yes, it is not admissible yes so sir even always voluntary it should be always voluntary yes sir, Min- yes, sir. so it is the duty of the court it is the duty of the court to see that only yes, facts which are admissible are admitted in evidence but it is a different matter that once it is admitted in evidence it can be acted upon it can be acted upon if it is admitted in evidence without objection then it can be acted upon because of it has already been made part of the evidence by waiver the party who had the right to waive sorry, actually waived it the party who had the right to object to it waived that right of objection did we correct to say that unstamped the promissory note yes it is not yeah. unstamped the promissory note Yes, it is not objected at the right point of time. All right, right, right. Okay, now we come to. There may be cases where the a document may contain admissible as well as inadmissible evidence. Admissible as well as inadmissible evidence. Can you just? Uh, uh, visualize any such a situation. A document may contain. admissible and inadmissible evidence the classic example is 
a confession a confession a confession of an accused section 25 and 26 of the indian evidence act section 25 says that admission to a police officer is inadmissible whether it is voluntary or not it is entirely different whether it is before or after investigation that is uh, entirely different then again section 26 any admission made by the accused in the custody of a police officer that is uh, irrelevant at the same time section 27 says that a part of the confession statement is admissible provided the conditions in it are satisfied so there may be cases where a document may contain admissible part and inadmissible part inadmissible part we cannot say that there cannot be such a rule there is such a rule section 27 has been held constitutional by the supreme court there is nothing uh, wrong in it now we have seen that section 5 declares section 5 declares that evidence may be given off facts in issue and relevant facts or fact declared relevant by the indian evidence act so what is the significance of it what is the significance of it when a fact is declared relevant relevant has it got any other significance section 655 they are the provisions which declare facts are relevant are they or do they stand on the same footing do they stand on the same footing they do not stand on the same footing see come to section 21 section 21 or even section 6 or any other section like that or classic example is section 21 section 21 provides that an admission is relevant admission is relevant that's all what it says at the same time section 31 provides that admissions are not a conclusive proof of the matter submitted but they may operate as a stopper under the provisions here and after contained we know the general law or the settled position that admission is a substantive evidence an admission is a substantive evidence unless it is proved erroneous or it is uh, uh, made under a mistake it operates against the maker of the admission with full force with full force so it is a substantive evidence and what do you mean by substantive evidence what do you mean by substantive evidence because a distinction has been made by the provisions contained in sections 6255 that is relevant facts with regard to this effect effect section 21 declares that it is relevant admission section 32 provides that the statement of a person who is not available for examination is relevant classic example is dying declaration and it is substantive evidence all everybody knows it the conviction of a party an accused can be on the basis of dying declaration alone there is no prohibition then what do you mean by substantive evidence that is the question before us by substantive evidence what we mean is that it may be an it is an evidence which may form foundation for the court to enter a finding on a particular issue or in the list itself the suit itself or the proceedings itself in the proceedings itself this is actually meant by substantive evidence the word i use this the substantive evidence means an evidence which may form the foundation i did not say which should form or which forms what is the reason because there may be substantive evidence but it may not be strong it may not be strong it may be a weak evidence take a case where this dying declaration is there 
in ke the case of dying declaration suppose there are some suspicious doubtful circumstances you will say that mm, there is a suspicious circumstance i am not sure about the correctness of the dying declaration so though it is declared relevant though it is held to be a substantive evidence it does not form a foundation for the uh, conviction of the accused in such cases and in such cases the court will always uh, seek for corroboration corroboration because that substantive evidence is weak so when a substantive evidence is weak the court looks for corroboration case of confession also same thing there is a strong judicial confession a strong judicial confession but the prudence is that the court shall not act upon it the court should always seek for corroboration especially when it is a retracted confession so merely because it may form the foundation of a conviction or foundation for making an entry on a particular uh, finding on a particular issue we cannot say that it is always uh, can form the foundation because it may be weak but if there is no suspicious circumstance there is no suspicious circumstance a dying declaration alone is sufficient to convict an accused a confession alone is sufficient to convict an accused there is nothing wrong in it so that is what we call a substantive evidence but i said that all the provisions from section 6055 which deal with the relevancy of facts do not stand on the same footing two categories of uh, relevant facts are there under these provisions the first category is the provisions which declare that they are uh, relevant without any qualification section 21 it simply declares that a admission is a relevant fact section 32 it simply declares that the dying declaration clause 1 dying declaration is a relevant fact a relevant fact it means that the court can on the basis of that evidence alone take a finding and derive finding there is nothing wrong in it but on the other hand at least there are two sections which are qualified see section 31st 30 section 30 when more persons than one are being tried jointly for the same offense and a confession made by one of the persons affecting himself and some other of such persons is proved that means the confession of a co-accused is proved the court may take into consideration such confession as against such other persons as well as against the person who makes such confession that means it is a, uh, it can be an evidence against the maker of the confession as well as the co uh, the co accused who has been implicated by the conflict maker of the confession what is the phrase used here it is not declared relevant instead the section says the confession of the co accused if it is proved the court may take it into consideration what does it mean the court may take into consideration means it is not substantive evidence it is not substantive evidence it also can be taken into consideration it only means it also can be taken into consideration oh it has a certain uh, some implications especially in criminal cases see in criminal case sorry this is applicable only in criminal cases in criminal cases these are some implications it means that if the only evidence the prosecution proposes to adduce against a particular accused is only the confession of the co accused 
then it is a case of discharge. It is a case of discharge. Because the section says that confession of a court use can be used only for corroboration, may be taken into consideration. That means it can be used only for corroboration. It is not a substantive evidence. It is not a substantive evidence. And if that is the only evidence the prosecution proposed to use evidence against, against an accused, it's a case of discharge. discharge. The so fact in this that on the point is <clears throat> AR for Supreme Court 1184 AR 2012 Supreme Court 523 then the first decision is Kashmira Singh, AR 1952 Supreme Court. 52 Supreme Court 159. Then there are two recent decisions, AR 2018 Supreme Court. 3574. AR 2019 Supreme Court, 3363, 3363. So this 2019 Supreme Court, it, it clearly said that it's a case of discharge. There is no question of framing issue, uh, framing charge against the accused. The only evidence proposed to be adduced by the prosecution is confession of co-accused because it can be used only for corroboration, not as a substantive evidence. So in this, in this context, sir, could you yes. explain the um, 114B presumption, the evidence, the accomplice is unworthy of credit? Say, it, uh, sometimes it may appear that it is a conflicting Stand taken by the Indian Evidence yes, Act. Yes, sir. Section 133. An accomplice shall be a competent witness yes. against an accused person, and a conviction is not illegal merely because it is proceeds upon the uncorroborated testimony of an accomplice. an accomplice. Here there is a difference between confession of co accused and accomplice. accomplice. The case of confession of co-accused covered by section 30, strictly speaking, it is no evidence. Oh. It does not come under the definition of evidence because the maker of the confession uh, does not enter the witness box. Witness box. So it is not an evidence under the definition evidence in the Indian Evidence Act. On the other hand, under section 34, it clearly refers to an evidence of an approval. See what does it say? Conviction is not illegal merely because it is proceeds upon the uncorroborated testimony. Yes. Sir. So that means the government has a witness. An approval. Approval. That is what section 133 says. That is evidence. Unlike section 30. Now we come to 114, illustration B. Illustration B. The court may presume, see, discretionary, the court may presume the existence of any fact which it thinks likely to have happened, a regard being had to the common cause of natural events, human conduct, and public and private business in their relation to the facts of the particular case. The court may presume illustration that an accomplice is unworthy or credit, unworthy of credit, unless unworthy, 
credit unless he is a corroborated in material particulars material particulars and illustration be as to illustration be the second part a person of the highest character is to try for causing a man's death by an act of negligence in arranging certain machinery be a person of equally good character also took part in the arrangement disguised precisely what was done and admits and explains the common carelessness of a and himself see so is there any conflict there is no conflict there is no conflict 114 is only a caution it's a rule of prudence the reason is that this particular witness committed the offense along with the accused who are being tried and now as he has been offered pardon he has stand against the fellows the person who did the crime along with him and he is a betrayer he has betrayed he has betrayed the accused who are being tried and can there be a reliable betrayer ordinarily we said that a betrayer cannot be relied uh, cannot be relied on this is the reason but the illustration makes it clear that it depends on the facts of the case it depends upon the facts of the case and what section 133 says see an accomplice shall be a competent witness against an accused and a conviction is not illegal merely because merely that word merely has to be emphasized so merely because it comes from an accomplice you cannot say that no no no, no i will not convict him if it is reliable okay you can do it can do it that's all what the section 133 says there is no conflict between 114b and illustration b and 133 i just wanted to point out the distinction because no one should get confused between section yes. 30 and the accomplice evidence yes now sir one there is a decision of the supreme court yes constitution bench state yes. of bihar versus basavan city ar yes. 58 supreme court 500 yes that is regarding the accomplice evidence yes okay now we come to so we have seen the terms uh, fact fact in issue relevant fact relevancy admissibility uh, and uh, substantive uh, evidence corroborative evidence sorry one more section i have to read one more section section 34 section 34 section 34 entries in books of accounts including those maintained in an electronic form regularly kept in the course of business are relevant so it is declared relevant it may appear that is a substantive evidence that's like section 21 and 32 but see the subsequent part of the section wherever they refer to a matter in which the court has to adhere but there is a rider but such statements shall not alone be sufficient evidence to charge any person with liability that means it is not a substantive evidence it no. can be used only for corroboration it can be used only for corroboration ar 1963 supreme court ar 1963 supreme court 1850 AR 67 Supreme Court 1058 AR 71 Supreme Court 2551 AR 89 Supreme Court 1269 so a mere proof of the accounts will not cast any liability on the party the person who made the entry should come and depose should come and depose if it is a part payment then if it is evidence by the writing then it should be proved by the party if it is a loan it is in the account book mere production of account book is not sufficient the person who lent it the person who made the entry should enter the witness box 
and suppose i lend him money i lend him money then that is a substantive evidence section 34 accounts book can be used for corroboration for corroboration so these are two these two sections clearly indicate that the only purpose for which the evidence when they men, the facts mentioned in those sections are only for corroboration this does not mean that the facts which are proved by the other sections they are all strong evidence they are substantive but may become weak on the facts and circumstances of the case that will depend upon the facts and circumstances of the case okay yes. okay uh, probability value probability value this is another term we and we use in this uh, connection probability value probability value is nothing but the weight that is to be attached to a particular piece of evidence is the weight that is to be attached to a particular piece of evidence we have seen that merely because there is a dying declaration the court is not bound to convict the accused if it is a weak evidence if it is a weak evidence the court will not if there are suspicious circumstances the court will not convict the accused unless there are evidence there is evidence to corroborate it so probability value is different from relevancy proof etc etc merely because that fact is proved the court may not act upon it the court need not act upon it okay now we have seen that evidence may be section when i took when i read this section 5 i gave emphasis on the phrase evidence may be given that may be oral or document or material evidence whatever it be now see there are some provisions in the indian act evidence act which say that some questions may be asked some questions may be asked what is the difference between this section 5 and these provisions see section 146 When a witness is cross-examined, he may, in addition to the questions here in the report above, ask any questions which tend to test his veracity, to discover who he is, shake his credit, etc., etc. Okay. So this has nothing to do with relevancy. See, relevancy means you can give evidence. that means you can examine witnesses you can produce documents you can produce material uh, evidence but here it says that it has nothing to do with relevancy it is individual oriented it is individual oriented it is directed towards that particular witness it affects his uh, evidence and section 146 applies only in the course of the examination in the course of the examination you are the parties and need to put some questions and the phrase used is not may give evidence the party may give evidence is not seen but you can put some type questions for the limited purpose so that's the difference between the phrase used the it may uh, adduce evidence i have seen rustishta that is why i specifically mentioned the rustishta so here some questions may be asked nothing else so we have uh, i think we have already discussed all the terms yes uh, all the terms are relevant for our purpose yes sir no no there are some questions sir yes by the participants yes the first question is yes mr harindra you can ask the question i think <laughs> yes 
<laughs> the questions are actually put, okay, okay. how to learn how to learn evidence science a very general question oh my god <laughs> you can learn evidence science only by practice only by practice practice in the sense you need not how you need not conduct any case because you know advocacy is a profession which demands a skill and skill you do not get by birth skill is ability acquired it is an acquired ability how can you acquire it you can acquire it by practice you can acquire it by practice and if don't worry if you have no case you go and sit in the court where this uh, uh, senior advocates or advocates who are best in the cross examination or examination chief how they conduct the cases what questions were objected to by the court what was the form in which the questions were put and what was the uh, objection raised by the other party what is the stand taken by the court this is how you learn this exercise it is an intellectual exercise that intellectual exercise you can learn only by this observation and by practice so observation also you can learn it then oh, sir i was i was i was listening to justice uh, i'm sorry uh, uh, ramjit milani stop on how the trials are being conducted these days in india yes he said of his karachi it used to be jury trial and every time there will be an objection and judge will decide mm. now he says that cross examination is dead in india because the way in which trials are going on in trial courts where one or two trials take place at the same time of course we don't have it in most of the south indian states especially not in kerala but uh, it would be difficult sir obviously yes. as you put it in the our kerala context obviously in kerala context you can sit in a court and understand yes but here this is a difficulty because if, unless the judge is uh, deciding relevancy and admissibility on the spot it is pointless in uh, in the trial becomes also a farce that that ability shows the middle of a judicial officer yes sir the yes, moment sir. a question is a question is put or the witness opens his mouth the judge should decide whether it is admissible or not that shows yes, the ability sir. of competence of judicial officer he cannot say oh i will just go and uh, Um, um, go and uh, study this uh, treatises on evidence act. Evidence and tomorrow we will decide whether it can be admitted or not. See what is stated by this uh, well-read orders is this: when a witness opens his mouth to make a statement which is inadmissible, the court shall stop him even before he completes that statement. because the moment he completes the statement or the moment the other witness gives the answers even though it is not recorded in the deposition it will remain recorded in the mind of the judge so in a 50 50 case what happens the judge will think hmm even though that was not recorded so oh, such a fact is there so that will cause prejudice in him that will tilt the scale this is the yes. reason why this uh, all this say before he completes the sentence the court should prohibit him no don't complete it so now what is the situation yes there is no question of objection <laughs> everything is done by this uh, yes. uh, commissioners yes now the next question is some documents are marked and some exhibited but in order to in the order sheet judge writes that all exhibits are objected to mode of proof <laughs> what should be done it is an illegal procedure side. it is an illegal procedure illegal procedure it's an illegal procedure because i have already told you the moment a witness opens his mouth to make a statement the if it is uh, irrelevant or inadmissible the court should stop him likewise if a document is tendered in evidence before it is uh, barred before it is made part of the evidence the court has to take a decision yes but sir there, there there is a there is a supreme court decision i think 
that if there is an uh, admissibility can be postponed to a later stage. Can that is true, but later, later yes, sir. the Supreme Court held yes, that, sir. no, it is not permitted. That is in uh, Shalimar chemicals case. That is uh, the first day, sir, the decision you mentioned is the year 2001 Supreme Court. Well, yes, 2001 But in Shalimar case, that is a 2018, sorry, 2010, volume 8 SEC 423, volume 8 SEC 423, the Supreme Court have said that the issue of admissibility should not be left open and hanging yes. by making them as exhibits subject to objection of proof and admissibility. Yes. The subject to proof is a term which can, should be, can be used only in a particular situation. It cannot be yes. used with regard to admissibility. Suppose I am the party in a case. I am the plaintiff, the defendant. The allegation is that I my allegation is that he borrowed one lakh rupees from it, from me. He denies it. Then I rely on a letter written by the defendant to our common friend Vijay Gumar. Say so when I am examined as a party, I am examined as the first witness. I produce the uh, letter. But this letter can be proved only by whom? By the person who wrote it, that is the defendant, he himself will not do it, or a person who has seen it, or by adducing expert evidence. That does not mean that yes. I cannot tender any evidence. I tender it saying that this is the letter handed over to me by Vijay Kumar. I would only say that. This is the letter handed over to me by Vijay Kumar. Or suppose Vijay Kumar sent a letter to me by post. I would say that this is the letter received by me by post. To that extent, my evidence is admissible. And then the court will say, this is marked subject to proof. That means, though it is marked, the court does not take it as proof of the contents. That is a reminder to the court. The court should not be misled later that it is admitted in evidence. No, it is marked only for reference. And subsequently, if the person who sent the letter or Vijay Kumar who saw this defendant write this letter is not examined, it remains mere written hearsay. A written hearsay. So you shall, a judge shall never do it. Yeah, just yes. shall never say that all the documents were marked subject to object. <laughs> yes. The one thing is that suppose that, the document is is... Out, that document is marked. How can the court prevent, prohibit the other party from cross-examining on this point? So there will be examination, chief, there will be cross-examination. And after everything is over. And everything is over now. And later, what is the meaning of uh, entering a finding by the trial court itself that I should not have uh, uh, recorded it? That is uh, not sensible. Yes. Yes, Mr. Khairi. Hello. 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 Uh, hi, sir. I, hi, sir. I think uh, Harinder, sir, has uh, dropped his yeah, he's dropped back. He joined back, sir. I think there was a problem with his net connection. He is just joining maybe. back, sir. Yeah. Maybe there was some. Uh, yes, sir. He's back. Yeah. We are able to hear you, sir, but your video is not there. Harinder, sir. Okay, maybe some problem. Hello. Hello. Yes. I can hear. Next question, sir, is. Is my video available? My audio no, is... sir. We are not able to see your audio video. Is audio is coming, sir. Your voice itself is threatening. No problem. <laughs> 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 yes. So, what is the... Not audible.
sir we are able to see your video now but yeah i think uh, we yeah now we are able to hear sir yeah, yeah. Now the thing is the next question is uh, uh Uh, next question is what is the place of charge in relation to the vaccine issue what charge, is it charge in crpc what is the place of charge in crpc in relation to vaccine issue say i have already told you that in civil cases there will be issues framed issues are framed and issues are framed on the basis of uh, pleadings and documents answers to interviews etc 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 but in criminal cases what the party has to prove or the prosecution has to prove is the ingredients of the offense the party the prosecution has to prove the ingredients of the offense so vaccine issue will be the ingredients of the offense in criminal cases but if there is a defense set up by the accused then that also will just like insanity consent that also will form a vaccine issue that is vaccine issue that become a vaccine issue so charge is framed a charge is framed only on the basis of the materials produced by the prosecution and the accused is not at heard the accused is not at heard suppose even in the cross examination he does not disclose his evidence but he discloses his evidence in the 313 examination or in the defense uh, evidence defense evidence then then also packing issue will be different so there is no question of the court ascertaining vaccine issue before a judgment is written or before an evidence is closed in a criminal case charge is only noticed to the accused that these are the facts the prosecution proposes to prove against you that is the only notice just like a plaint no written statement here yes so far as civil cases are concerned sir issues arise when material propositions of fact and law averred by one party are denied by the other party so other there fact. is a material proposition averred by one party and the denial by the other party now the next question is how the hearing of other men become relevant is it relevant under section 6 of indian how? evidence act how the hearing uh, that is he means is uh, statements ah. given by bystanders it yes. is relevant under section 6 we have already stated already stated because it is a matter which can be heard section 5 declares that evidence may be given evidence may be given of fact the fact is here is the bank shout out so if a person hears it then he can give evidence he can give evidence under section 60 that is why i told you that even this hearsay evidence the concept of hearsay evidence the meaning differs in different contexts the original is an exception ah is that an is exception the, to the direct evidence that is the exception to hearsay evidence but again there cannot be another exception see what is the exception he did not see the murder he did not see the murder here the neighbor heard the mother of the accused shout my wife my husband my son killed his wife he did not see anything so that is hearsay but so far as the shouting of the mother is concerned that is a direct evidence spontaneous exclamation yes that is direct evidence only a person who heard it can, can come and say i heard yes. her shout like this so first it is a hearsay exception then it is not hearsay direct evidence yes that can be proved only by direct evidence yes then there is a which i don't think uh, by one anonymous attendee it is a very long question hmm i think uh, it is not very relevant okay the fact is admissible is it necessary to be relevant for a fact to be admissible is it necessary to be relevant you already explained that sir i it have already explained it need not be relevant but evidence may be given of relevant fact only yes see section 146 they are admissible those questions are admissible though they are not relevant because that is a person individual oriented to test his yes, veracity sir. yes yes now the next question is in dv uh, domestic violence cases how can an affidavit by a complainant mm. is considered as evidence without conducting cross examination so an affidavit is filed by the complainant no cross examination is conducted can it be considered as evidence i think it is very 
that is a question domestic violence act domestic violence pwdv pwdv okay say there there is a practice of chief affidavit is there so okay. affidavit by the complainant okay. is there that is the only question is it because the court can lay down its own procedure etc etc is there just just take a civil case in a criminal forum okay but uh, how there is no cross examination the party did not cross examine that the that the question is not very clear now okay. see now, whether there is cross examination or no cross examination the moment the court records one sentence of the witness it becomes evidence in the case yes whether, whether that evidence can be acted upon is a different question different question the evidence in the case no there Suppose, can be a, there, there after, can be a situation sir where the after the examination chief the case was adjourned for cross examination meanwhile he died can we say that that is no evidence in the case that is evidence in the case but what value can be given to that evidence because yes. he was not available for it is a different matter now yes. the another question is one witness affidavit of evidence is contrary to the other witness yes but the witness is not allowed to be cross examined can the contents of the witness affidavit on evidence how, how? cross examination is a right it is a right you that can't be yeah. denied yes uh q is a complaint q complainant filed a complaint on a paper which is on computer print out fir was lodged and that complaint objection was raised by the defense counsel on the basis that there is no compliance with section 65b of the indian evidence act shall the complaint still be exhibited in evidence so uh, how can it be see now this recent decision is arjun pandey's pandra case is there yes. it is well settled settled now uh, it now is 65 is mandatory 65 okay. is mandatory mandatory if it is to be tendered in evidence but this question is not very clear fir ah, is not fir Yeah, fair. Yeah, how? Yeah, fair. Yeah, the case was registered on the basis of it. I don't know. It is also can't be said. The person electronic has... document without 65B admitted in evidence. Unfortunately, no objection was raised. How to deal with it? Not okay, there is a decision of the Supreme Court. Recent yes. decision of the Supreme Court, which says that it is a case of waiver. I shall give you that decision. Yes, sir. That is um, A. R. 2017 Supreme Court. A. R. 2017 Supreme Court. 3441. 3441. So now we have the state of Himalaya. Now, sir, the uh, decision in uh, Parliament attack case is no longer good law. Not good law. Not good law. It, uh, On that particular point. Yes. Yeah. Now, now the next question is not relevant. In the sensitive Uttara case, the accused confessed. Confessed. Pending matters. Pending matters. Uh, I will not uh, give any uh, answer. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. No. Uh, not proper, that is not, uh, not proper. Asking. Can I raise this issue in appeal? as also recent judgment in fact admissibility issue admissibility. that is also see admissibility no, no, sir, this be... is relating to utras case yes oh, i see no 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 then it may come no. in section 1645 ab crpc hmm. why it is used as substantive piece of evidence no it is not a no, substantive piece it is not substantive evidence it is not substantive that is the the state but, okay but uh, suppose uh, uh, that person is not available etc etc that is a different matter yes 1545 capital a capital a yes. crpc yes that is the rule of necessity rule of necessity there the there is a spelling mistake it is used as wedding field it is actually wedding fields case 
Yes. Yeah. Clarify bedding fields case. So that yes. was a case where that uh, woman, R versus bedding field. Look what Harry has done to me. Then uh, that was not admitted because the transaction was over. That was then later criticized by the House of Lords several. Yes. This also because they said the transaction was uh, was continuing because she died after that. The lady who punched her throat and said. But of yes. course, Lord Wilberforce in that case said that it is not admissible. Yes. So that is the question. How the court should check authenticity of the evidence produced by court and police, by police. That is a, the court cannot check it except through cross examination by the other side, yes. unless it is a patent. Then the court can exercise the power under Section One Sixty Five of the Act. In appropriate cases, the court can exercise the power under Section One Sixty Five if the accused fail to discharge his duty. The counsel of the accused or the counsel fail the accused to fail to discharge his duty to conduct the case properly. Then the court can exercise power under Section One Sixty Five. The next question is: Is there any difference between admissibility in civil and criminal cases? Absolutely not. No. Then the question is: uh, FSL report. There is no other evidence either document or regarding spurious pledging of gold ornaments. Yes. This is a weak evidence. Say. Yes. Sir. That. Under Section uh, 293, then it is becomes a part of the evidence in the case. Yes, sir. So, what probative value that it has to be given? That's a different question. Suppose there is no evidence as to pledging by this particular thing by the accused. Okay, merely because it is proved that what is produced before the court is a spurious gold, there cannot be any conviction. Again, the bedding wheels question is. Bedding fields case is asked, and then the court refused to. Uh, can the can plaintiff in the can plaintiff change dates in his chief affidavit? That is the can plaintiff plan plaintiff change the dates mentioned in his sentences. There is something wrong with the sentence. Okay, I think this is what he asked. That is in his evidence. Mentioned. Another he can he can um, um, mention a different date. Different date. It will be to. It can be done. Suppose it is an obvious mistake. Yes, typographical error. He can explain his evidence. There is nothing wrong. It depends upon the facts of the case. Yes. How far is character evidence relevant and admissible in civil suits and criminal yes. proceedings? See, we cannot uh, discuss those matters uh, in this uh, brief session. That is why yes, because sir, everybody yes. knows it. So then, these are all the same questions have been put. Yes. Then the question relating to 161 and uh, how 161 of the CRPC probably this section is not mentioned. Uh, which also, I think, sir, it is a elaborate thing which we not elaborate discuss. thing. We cannot discuss it within this uh, and, uh, time. Then principles of res juste, I think we have already given yeah. series for our purpose. Yes, sir. Person purpose. Then the another very enthusiastic person, mm. sir. What about all India Judicial Service exam? <laughs> 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 that is for the parliament to decide whether they should yeah. be on the judicial service. <laughs> okay. And sir, uh, thank you very much for the enlightening class. This is the second time we are meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Since you have, uh, since you have uh, made in-depth study in this law of evidence, it was very helpful. Sir. Yes. Now, sir, the uh, incidentally, sir, I have edited the second edition of the uh, syllabus. Evidence yes. evaluation of evidence in criminal cases. It is second a, edition is out in market. Oh, yes. Already in market. Or, already in market, sir. I'll get you a complimentary copy. Thank you, sir. thank you, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Lai. I can say good night now. Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> good night and good luck. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Harindranath.